Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I am here with uh, Rini and Marek, who are the co-founders of Cello, a mobile-first blockchain with a strong emphasis on serving underserved communities. Before we talk with um, both of them, um, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Introducing the next generation of DYDX and the next version of the DYDX token. Welcome to the DYDX chain. New token mechanics mean you can stake to secure the network. Staking is fully decentralized and controlled by DYDX token holders. All fees are distributed to stakers. Earn rewards from using the DYDX protocol, with rewards planned for traders and early adopters too. New governance means you are in control. Trading has been democratized. You can vote on protocol improvements, token distributions, and more. Bridge your DYDX to seamlessly transition to DYDX chain. Bridge now at bridge.dydx.trade and contribute to the evolution of DYDX chain, open source and community driven. Run your own validator. Validating is fully permissionless. Join us on our mission to democratize access to financial opportunity today. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us back. <laughs> we had you on previously, but maybe we can do a quick round of introductions and giving a bit of background on who you guys are, how you met, and what makes you get up in the morning. Sure. Yeah, no, it's it's lots a lot has happened since we were last on the show. Um, but yeah, I was just doing the math the other day, Merrick. We've been working together for uh 12 years at this point so american has started a company previously we met at mit um that was an ai company though back then we didn't think about it in that way um but it was uh you know they're kind of the common thread there was it was actually helping small businesses so again sort of you know sort of you know trying to support the little guy um by better competing online um and we uh sold the company uh, to to GoDaddy and worked there for a few years, helped take GoDaddy uh, GoDaddy go public, and uh, after that we went back to the drawing board and uh, yeah, a lot of the ideas that we were getting kind of excited about were things that you know we felt the technology to solve us was was Web three and so that was you know getting us into the 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 rabbit hole. So yeah. Um, going on seven years of working on uh, what has become Cello, which is which is super interesting. Yeah, you definitely make us sound old in crypto when you say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to believe uh, seven years have passed already. Um, yeah, maybe just to add to that, you know, I have a technical background uh, at MIT where where Renny and I met. I was working on a PhD in, in parallel computing, and. Um, uh, working on something called deterministic multi-threading, which just very coincidentally uh, has a lot of relevance for scaling um, blockchain platforms today. Um, and yeah, coming back to the origin story, you know, we initially uh, started by building a wallet on top of uh, Ethereum. Um, that wallet has now evolved and become Valora, uh, which you can play around with. But back then, um, you know, we wanted to make something that was just really easy for everyone to use, um, that was stablecoin focused, that could be like a kind of a global Venmo like product. Um, and we tried for a while making it um, be sufficiently easy uh, for for normies, although back then we didn't call them normies. Uh, and ultimately, we realized that that to do that, we needed to to launch or to work with a community to launch a new chain that had some of the features that would allow you to build a really easy to use experience. Um, fast forward to today, the, the network is live and it's been humming along um, really well for, for the last couple of years. Uh, Valora is out uh, and used in, in countless countries. Yeah, the community and ecosystem keeps growing. And so it's just, it's just been really exciting. Yeah, super interesting. Um, you just alluded to the fact that kind of um, Cello had to be built in a specific way in order to kind of um, work for Nomis and on mobile phones. So what does that mean concretely in terms of technology? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, you know, scalability. 
Um, you need a, a chain that can keep gas fees cheap. Um, just last week, Seller processed 20 million uh, transactions in one day without raising gas fees. Um, processing, I think, on average, 270 or so um, transactions per second for, again, for 24 hours. So I think that's a good um, example of just how scalable um, we've been able to make. Uh, and really, it's the validator ecosystem has been able to make uh, the seller platform. Secondly, um, we really wanted it to have a mobile focus. Um, and so we worked really hard to create a ZK Snark based like client uh, that can sync on mobile devices. Uh, but I think even more importantly, we worked really hard to create something that uh, we now call Social Connect, which is a protocol that lets you um, effectively connect your phone number to your wallet address in a privacy preserving way. This is an optional feature that some wallets implement, uh, and the wallets that do implement it uh, allow you to effectively send uh, value to, to people in your contact list, which uh, is just um, a real delight for, for anybody who's not crypto savvy. And then finally, um, we, we learned early on uh, through various tests in, in Argentina that Paying for gas with volatile assets was just too too confusing for a lot of users, um, and so we we actually built native support for paying for gas with tokens that doesn't require account abstraction. So this is supported by EOAs, um, and um, that allows users to send you know stable coins to other users who can then forward those stable coins onwards uh, without ever having to think about it. Um, you know what a gas currency is and, and how to get one. There is a whole lot to unpack here. Maybe let's go through them one by one because kind of I want to understand them uh, in detail. Um, so um, how do you make it scale? So kind of how do you get more transactions per second? Because kind of there's always kind of this scalability dilemma with uh, uh, security. How, how do you get it to scale to uh, such lengths? Yeah, so I think first and foremost by having an efficient proof of state consensus protocol. Um, I think, uh, and then secondly, um, working hard to, to ensure that EVM execution is happening quickly. Um, I think both of these generally are, um, challenges for EVM chains. Um, and, you know, we've been chipping away at kind of both of these. The reality is, um, on the consensus side, you know, there, there is, you know, obviously this trilemma and it's difficult to achieve Ethereum level levels of kind of decentralization while achieving, you know, one block finality, short block times, uh, with a really high throughput. Um, and, and that's, um, why we're also really, really excited about you know, this coming home to Ethereum, so to speak. Um, through this L2 plan that Solo announced, uh, or I guess that C-Labs proposed and then the community voted on and agreed upon uh, earlier in the year. Um, and so I think by transitioning Solo to an L2, we can inherit uh, Ethereum's decentralization while still offering uh, these really great features, these this high throughput, this, um, yeah, just this high throughput that, that the chain provides. We'll get into that in just a second, but um, maybe let's kind of go back to kind of um, the way that kind of Cello, um started. So basically, are you saying that kind of the way that you could scale um, so efficiently was by having a fairly constricted set of validators when compared to Ethereum? So Ethereum has like 600,000 validators, right? So basically, how much did you have, have to constrict it in order uh, for you to kind of get these uh, really amazing throughputs? Celos right now has 110 validators, um, and it's actually constricted not by the consensus protocol and scalability limits, but more by the um, the zk snark like client that we have. We built this like client, started working on it I think four years ago, launched it two years ago, using um, I would say first generation zk technology. It's a huge achievement. Um, we're really, really proud of it. Um, but it does use a very, very big circuit. Two to the 27 constraints using a very big curve, PW6. And that is a very big proof uh, that we have to generate daily on a very big machine 
uh, and um, we couldn't increase the validator set uh, beyond the current limit without making that even more onerous. Um, and so, so that is a current constraint. But as it so happens, you know, it, it, uh, we think it's a, a, a really great level of decentralization, especially for a decentralized sequencer, as, again, solar transitions to an L2. Okay, so basically that means like users have a ZK Lite client on their phone, um, and that means kind of they don't have the full state, but kind of the full state is kind of like processed by 110 validators, kind of giving you that level of decentralization. Is that is that kind of reframing it correctly? So yes, wallets can can use wallets and DApps can can use. Uh, we have some code that works in. in um, uh, using Wasm that works even in a browser, wallets and apps can use the like client, uh, or they can use a decentralized RPC endpoint like Lava, or they can use a, a trusted endpoint like Infura uh, and connect the chain that way. Absolutely. Okay. Why don't we see more mobile-first blockchains? Because in principle, it seems almost like a no-brainer to kind of that there would be at least some because kind of if you look at the world as a whole, almost everyone is kind of primarily on their phones rather than on um, laptops or m more powerful devices. Why don't we see more of those chains? Yeah, maybe I can I can jump in. I do think there's certainly, you know, it's been surprised to us for how long it's taken for more, you know, for the broader ecosystem to kind of think more about mobile. Um, and we're, we're seeing this, you know, even if you look at sort of the... Um, Kind of average transactions on say uniswap or curve on Celo, right versus on like ethereum mainnet right amounts tend to be smaller people are accessing these steps from their from their phones right um and i think that's uh there's a fundamentally different use case and for a lot of the early builders right i think uh, it was just more lucrative to focus on sort of more high value transactions right that traditionally still you know tend to happen um, on desktops, right? Um, so for us, it was really, it started just with a being, you know, in a sense, being very determined to try to make this work for everyone, right? And obviously, like you said, most people have mobile devices and it kind of extends into the ecosystem, right? Where there's the the technical architecture of the chain is, is one side, but then also, you know, the kind of wallets that are being built, right? And there's a rich ecosystem of wallets that includes Valora and others, that um, you know have enabled, in a sense, like this kind of mobile-first experience of of Web three, but then it extends all the way into the DApps, right, where people are have built sort of much simpler interfaces, things that can actually be more easily accessed through a wallet, right, or you know hooks into kind of wallets that kind of allow you to kind of interact with these protocols. And I think there's there's a whole um, yeah kind of space for innovation that I think is we're just starting to kind of see happening. And I'm quite excited about when I think about, you know, even going into the next uh, cycle where my hope is that a lot of the, you know, usage and kind of activity is going to come from real world users, um, not speculating on asset prices, but, you know, accessing these rails for, you know, getting access to credit, right? Or making payments, commerce, all these things. And, uh, that, in a sense, um, needs to have mobile at the core, um, and so we hope that some of the stuff that we've built and we haven't we haven't gotten through the whole list, so we we should uh, come come back to some of these innovations like Social Connect that are um, you know or Fiat Connect that are kind of starting to be more widely adopted, even you know with interest beyond the cell ecosystem right now with the L2 move uh, can pave the way for that to happen more quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Let's come back to uh, to these usability improvements. When most people think about blockchain, kind of, it's difficult to kind of even explain to fairly tech forward people, right? It's like, okay, download download this wallet. Oh, okay, this is your seed phrase. You have to write it down. You can never show it to anyone. You can also never lose it because otherwise everything is gone. So how how do you get from there to a place where kind of you can't just give it like less technology forward people. You can give it like actual honest to god normies i can give i can give another example america you i'm sure you have a bunch too but i mean uh, this is kind of a very recent example so uh opera um very successful browser company right i mean their uh market share in africa is like 90 percent, and opera mini is a browser that's 
built for Android and is extremely popular because they also subsidize uh, bandwidth for for their African users. Uh, they built a seller wallet into into Mini called Mini Pay, and the onboarding uh, is quite magical. I mean, people. I mean, they're on Android, right? So people can very easily back up uh, their seed phrase on their on their Google account. And you know, we've uh, seen this since the launch of the product in mid September. You know, there no one has lost their seed phrase, right? There've been like I don't know. Thousands. I don't want to reveal like you know, numbers that they're not ready to reveal, but there's been a very high number of users restoring their wallets successfully without kind of a glitch. And that's a massive success for Web3, right? That's something that a few years ago we would have all been just very worried about, right? That that would just, you know, uh, result in a bunch of, you know, messages or support calls or people just, you know, being frustrated and giving up maybe. And um, I would say that's a problem that you know today really i mean we can sort of say it's 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 solved right we have the tools to to really onboard people that you know maybe other than sort of a browser or whatsapp don't really even use you know much you know on, on their phone right and so that's that's amazing right because that opens up a whole new uh population to participate in this digital economy which is i think why a lot of us are here yeah absolutely i i had no idea that opera penetration in Africa is that high. That's uh that's crazy. Yeah, it's it's over a hundred million people. It's wow. pretty impressive. Yeah. Um you said earlier that um uh basically um you let people pay gas in any token. Um how do you do that? Is it just kind of via relay network or how how is it implemented? Yeah, so it's actually implemented natively in the platform. So no relay is required, no paymasters required. Um and, and the way it works is um, the seller blockchain client um, basically supports a new envelope style transaction. Uh, envelope transactions were introduced um, with the IP1559 in Ethereum. And this new type of transaction basically takes an extra field that is a address for a token that you'd like to pay for gas with. And then we we technically don't allow um, paying for gas with any token. It's only through uh, a limited set of uh, allow listed tokens uh, that um, are governed through on chain governance. Solo has a kind of a DAO uh, that um, has a lot of different uh, functionality, and one of which is, I guess, maintaining this this allow list. And then basically the the client right before executing your transaction will uh, check that the token is that the gas currency desired gas currency is in the allow list and if so it will debit um, your balance in that token by doing an EVM call into the token contract to um, to deduct how much you're bidding for gas um, and then at the end of, of your transaction it will do the same to credit you any um, any balance that the owed to you for as a refund um and that's it and you know naturally to help validators order these transactions relative to each other we we do currently have each of these tokens um have an oracle that reports on the price relative to cello uh, it's technically not needed because validators can choose to order these things however they want using whatever price that they they, they want but we just wanted to make their lives easier and just have something that they can um, look at to make it easier for them to order the mempool. And, you know, the end result is really easy UX for end users, for wallets, for dApps. You don't have to have all of these extra complexity around, you know, relayers or uh, new types of ways of signing transactions and additional folks uh, playing a role in the platform. Uh, Everything just works natively really really easily and and honestly it's been a a really big success people really like being able to cash in into cusd and then be able to you know buy eth on a dex without having to go to a centralized exchange right if you think about kind of the the dream of enabling fully decentralized you know capital d dap um experiences um then allowing people to to cash into stable coins ideally to a stable coin that's pegged to their local currency uh and then to be able to start transacting straight away 
um, that's really a nice experience, a nice self-custodial uh, experience that that's possible on Celo and with Celo wallets um, that you know helps and support DApps uh, and and more decentralization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you think about confirmation time? So how 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 long is acceptable kind of for a mobile user um, who actually uses it for like a real world thing? Yeah, it's a great question. So we did some testing early on and we found that five seconds is still feels snappy enough. Uh, and so Solo has five second block times with one block finality. Um, that gives us more time to uh, achieve consensus, which uh, is is good for um, processing large amounts of transactions per second. But, you know, I think realistically, given that there are chains with lower uh, block times, I think as part of the L2 transition, we're talking about moving that down to something closer to two seconds. Uh, but the end result for users is, is going to be pretty similar. I think uh, if you transact on the Celo platform, everything feels you know very, very snappy. Cool. Um, so you guys cater heavily to the, to the global south. Are there challenges that you wouldn't have in the global north? For instance, I heard that... Um, that kind of device memory is often a problem. Um, so that basically, for instance, people can't install new apps because kind of they're out of uh, out of memory um, and uh, like problems we don't usually think about because kind of most people in our bubble have like uh, uh, the latest uh, iPhone or you know top of the line Android device. What has experience taught you? Yeah. I Maybe just expanding on the kind of mini pay mention. I mean, that was a big uh, factor. Also, I think when uh, we started chatting with them about sort of this product, and they told us sort of how they uh, launched products into the market. Right? I think this kind of uh, it mapped with a lot of things that we had heard um, and learned in in pilots or projects. Right? We had been a part of as as part of the Cello journey. Um, and there were some really nice benefits, right? So I mentioned that mini Opera Mini kind of subsidizes users' bandwidth, uh, which means that if you have a wallet that's in the browser, right, you also basically get subsidized, you know, uh, for for your wallet use. So that's that's really cool. Um, they built the actual wallets to be only a kind of two megabytes package um, compared to I think like I don't know, MetaMask is like sixty eight megabytes and. Coinbase wallet, like a lot more even then, right? So, and so that's where you're starting to get into challenges when you have users that are living from, you know, sort of 50 megabytes, 100 megabytes at a time, right? To get through the week and do all the things they need to do online on that. Um, the cost of sort of updating or even just installing a new app to try it is, is kind of prohibitive um, for, for a lot of users. So being really mindful uh, around that and, you know, Orienting the experience around that has been, yeah, definitely kind of a key factor. And again, this extends to to the ecosystem, right? And thinking through sort of every touch point, every bit of interaction, right? Is there stuff that you can sort of streamline and um, make work better, um, you know, um, on sort of the, those constrained environments and, and sort of low-end devices, I will say though, you know, I mean, as someone in the global north, uh, some of these improvements also, you know, feel quite nice uh, when you're, you know, kind of accessing things on the latest iPhone, right? So I think it's just like some of it is, you know, uh, things don't need to be as convoluted sometimes as they need to be, right? And sometimes simplicity, even when you are not constrained uh, on bandwidth, uh, can be kind of a nice, uh, can be a nice forcing function for a better experience. So. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, it's nice to have the start with sort of the kind of, you know, the users that will have most trouble accessing the experiences that you're building as an ecosystem. And then I think that has nice sort of downstream effects in terms of all users, right? And um, obviously, we have a lot of users in the global south, but, you know, there's also a lot of people in Europe and, you know, all over sort of the global north kind of using using seller products. Yeah, I think Luke uh, Rubelski wrote a book called Mobile First back in the day when Web2 companies were, were thinking about uh, their mobile first uh, transitions and journeys. 
And one of the things he talked about in that book is about when you build in a mobile-first manner, you you know you focus on bandwidth, you focus on you know band bundle size, all of these things that Rennie just mentioned. Uh, but then the end result is uh, everyone benefits, even people using your desktop applications. And certainly we've seen that in the solar ecosystem as well. One thing that I think uh, people all over the place will uh, benefit from is um, this user identity linking uh, linking to the to the phone numbers. What cryptographic methods do you use to ensure privacy and security in this uh, verification process? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and so we have this, this protocol, it's, it's called Social Connect, which under the hood uses another protocol called ODIS, which is um, a threshold cryptography system. So we use uh, threshold signatures on BLS 12.377 uh, that effectively allow uh, a quorum of uh, ODIS uh, nodes uh, to respond to any request to look up a... Um, a particular uh, phone number um, or the address for a particular phone number. And, and by doing this, no node on its own can uh, recover the phone number for or the address for a particular phone number uh, without uh, a threshold. I think it's 50% of these nodes uh, responding. And I think that's really, really nice because, you know, certainly it, it, uh, it offers privacy guarantees. It allows... Uh, these nodes in a distributed way. It's not quite decentralized because it's a permission set of Otis signers, but it's a um, a big set. There's, I think, tens of these nodes, uh, and they're all doing their own kind of attack detection to uh, make it uh, hard for any one attacker to try to um, identify all of these phone numbers. Okay, so basically, in essence, it's distributed um, set uh, with a threshold where basically I can ask them for the private key that is uh, somehow connected with your phone number. Basically, they, they, they give me that, but basically I can't go the other way around. Is that, is that correct or how do I think about it? That's close. I think with the one changes, they give you the um, not the private key, but they give you uh, a sulk that you can use to uh, derive the wallet address. And so the wallet addresses are stored on chain, but are uh, hashed with a unique salt per phone number. Uh, and that salt is what this Otis server, um, Otis servers uh, are, are giving you uh, for any given phone number. And, and you need to, to request it from a threshold of these servers. Okay, and if I want to update um, my address, I can... I can do that by contacting them too, right? Yes, you don't even need to contact them. You just update uh, on chain the mapping um, because you you know your own salt, and so uh, you're able to uh, to to update the mapping yourself. And can you do that counterfactually? So, so someone who's not been uh, registered with um, their phone number, can I send them? Is it deterministic? Can I send them a kind of funds and the um, threshold set um, can kind of know which uh, which address um, the 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 what it's going to be deployed to, kind of like create two. Yeah, it's a good question. So the salt is deterministic um, per deployment of Otis. We're on our second deployment now, um, and so there was a PKG that was done. Um, and so that's deterministic, but the and that's deterministic regardless of what portion uh, of these nodes respond, um, what 50% portion of these um, servers respond. But the second piece is registering your wallet address on chain, and that part is non-deterministic. You can register any wallet address. If I send it to someone who's not yet kind of signed up, it just goes into Nirvana. So, right, the solution for that flow is we have an escrow smart contract. And so wallets can detect that the user hasn't yet um, signed up at that phone number. Um, and so they send the money instead to an escrow smart contract. And then uh, the escrow smart contract will only release the funds to someone who signs up with that phone number. Uh, and then wallets can automatically um, fetch the funds as part of onboarding. 
Um, and so I think you're asking about how, what's the experience like for new for someone who's sending money to someone who isn't yet uh, doesn't yet have a wallet. And, and the answer is that the experience is exactly like you would hope it to be, which is that you know the user uh, can send the money anyway uh, and then gets prompted to to invite the um, the recipient you know to the platform, usually using like a WhatsApp or a text message. Uh, and then the, those users can then sign up and, and have the, the funds, claim the funds automatically. You said earlier that uh, that um, Cello announced um, over the summer that kind of it would, uh, or there was vote over the summer that kind of it would become an L2 on Ethereum rather than remaining its own L1. So specifically, kind of, if I recall correctly, um, you're going the Validium route on the OP stack um, with um, like data availability um, with Eigen DA. H how did you arrive at this decision? I mean, first of all, kind of like the general move kind of like of coming home to Ethereum rather than remaining your own L1 because obviously it also comes with drawbacks, right? I mean, you you, you do inherit a security from Ethereum to a certain, certain extent, but you also pay for it. Um, I mean... You avoid most of that <laughs> that cost by uh, by by not doing data availability on Ethereum natively, but it still comes with considerable cost. Which kind of when you when you look at um, serving the global south with kind of like low value transactions and so on, it it must have been a difficult decision, no? Maybe Merrick, let me jump in first, and then we can go into maybe more of the detail, but. Um, and I think you had mentioned this in the earlier part of the conversation, right? Uh, that when we first started Cello, we uh, actually built on Ethereum, right? And in in many ways, this has been a constant. I think we've been obviously closely following everything that was happening in the Ethereum world. And uh, the sort of idea had come up before, but this was the first time where, you know, also to what you pointed out, right? That, there was a potential design where the end user experience, particularly around uh, fees, right, would be workable um, in terms of not sort of creating kind of obstacles that would be too high to, you know, for the current sort of use cases on Cello, but also for the stuff that we want to continue to see on Cello. So uh, when that became clear, I think there was very quickly uh, kind of excitement building within the community. And uh, before we kind of when we're public with it in the sort of broader community, um, yeah, I think we we kind of did sort of our initial research on it and we can go into the details. But I will just say, and, you know, a lot of this work is driven out of C-Labs. Um, and so Merrick can, can, can comment more in the sort of play-by-play. <laughs> -play, but it's been just phenomenal to also see how, um, for us, it's kind of, it feels like a coming home moment, but also we've been, receiving such a lot of support from the broader Ethereum community and a lot of people that I think had followed our work over the years, but um, now I think felt sort of maybe also more uh, more urgency or just seeing that there may be kind of more opportunities to kind of partner and collaborate, which has been uh, really amazing to see. But but yeah, Mary, I'll hand it to you for some of the technical choices and that initial design and maybe kind of where where some of that uh, is uh, is now? Yeah, and you know, I think this has definitely been kind of a journey for the whole ecosystem and and community. I think, as Randy mentioned, you know, we we started off uh, building in Ethereum, um, and ultimately to accomplish what we wanted to to accomplish, we we felt that we had to work with the community to create an, a new chain, an EVM compatible chain, because we believed in Ethereum and we believed in the EVM but nonetheless still a new chain. And, you know, over the years, obviously, the roll-up um, base scalability roadmap um, kind of continued to get refined, more roll-ups launched. Uh, it became very, very clear that um, that Ethereum was succeeding with this strategy. And so given our excitement for, for Ethereum, you know, I think the community's actually been long talking about uh, ways, you know, going for as far back as 1.5, one and a half years ago, uh, you know, talking about what could Cello look like as as a potential L2. And so coming back to this year, you know, C-Labs 
um, I think with the announcement of Eigen DA, realized that, oh, actually there's a, there's a way for us to become an L2 while keeping gas fees cheap, while also doing it in a very Ethereum aligned way with Eigen DA, you know, effectively being run by Ethereum validators. You know, we felt that we could create an L2 design that preserves all of the features of Celo, all of the benefits of Celo, while still plugging into the Ethereum scalability roadmap and being part of, you know, Ethereum's scalability plans. And so I think that that was this aha moment for us and, and ultimately why, you know, C-Labs put forward this proposal. We wanted the proposal to be very concrete. And so we actually did the legwork to come up with an architecture that, uh, as you said, you know, leverage OP stack, uh, leverage Eigen DA. We also thought long and hard a lot about one block finality, which is a feature that Cello offers and we wanted to preserve, not, uh, and one that's not trivial for L2s to offer. Uh, and so we spent a bunch of time on that. We, we put forward a very detailed architecture proposal uh, that the community voted on. Um, I will say that, you know, since then, uh, we've got a lot of inbound from a lot of L2 stacks that is, have been pitching the community um, on, you know, other L2 technologies. And so even though even though C-Labs has been building an OP stack since July, since that proposal passed, um, there continues to be conversations at the community level about, you know, maybe there's uh, other ZK EVM stacks that might be a good fit for for Celo. And so um, that's been exciting to see. It's just been, you know, really great to see not just the whole Celo ecosystem get really excited about this, but, you know, the broader Ethereum ecosystem, the reception has been just absolutely amazing. And so it's been really, really great. How does single, single block finality kind of mesh with fraud proofs and kind of... Uh... Maybe it's a false dichotomy, but in my head, either you can kind of you get shared security from Ethereum, and then kind of you need to to let people um, to to leave them a path to actually access um, Ethereum security layer by kind of escalating the conflict on on the L two, um, or you get single slot finality. How do you toe that toe that line? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think the the answer relies on this kind of fundamental observation that uh, for finality, the the fraud proof window is actually not important and, and neither is, you know, CK proofs necessarily. Ultimately, finality for most L2s is accomplished by posting transactions uh, to the L1. Uh, and as soon as they're on the L1, they're deemed kind of final, right? Any full node uh, following the chain, deriving blocks on the chain uh, will 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 deem those blocks as final. The fraud proof window is actually irrelevant. That's mostly for the bridge itself, for the native bridge. Yeah, but not so much for finality. Um, and so there's two sources of um, potential reorgs that can happen in L2. Uh, one is from the L2 itself. So if you have a sequencer that tells you that the next block will look like this but then submits uh, a different block to the L1, then uh, L2 clients will have to reorg when they, you know, first they'll get the, the first block and they'll assume that that's kind of an unsafe but likely block to, uh, to get promoted to a finalized block. But then when they see what actually um, got posted to Ethereum, they're going to have to uh, reorg and, and roll back. And so that's one source of non term of reorgs. And then the other source of reorgs is just the L1 itself, right? If Ethereum reorgs, then the L2 uh, naturally has to reorg. And so to address this, we um, came up with a design that one, has a decentralized sequencer, uh, and two, relies on slashing for equivocation by that decentralized sequencer. Uh, so if the uh, in order for a um, transaction batch to be uh, to be kind of sequenced, you need two thirds of these sequencers to sign off on it. And if they ever sign off on another transaction batch and post that to Ethereum, 
uh, then that's easy to prove uh, and a slashable condition. And by having a more than one sequencer, you can actually have um, more stake that is at stake um, when uh, when these folks misbehave. And so that allows you to effectively have what we call kind of cello security to offer uh, a finality guarantee that can exist uh, in a shorter window than uh, whatever period by which you know batchers are, are submitting transactions to the L1. And then secondly, um, you know, for the L1 reorg, uh, the solution there is to effectively wait for transactions to be finalized on the L1 uh, before they are imported into the L2. So that means that any forced transactions, any deposit transaction that happens uh, on the L1, we have to wait 12 minutes effectively. Uh, before those transactions appear uh, on the L2. And, and that way, even if the L1 reworks, those transactions you know, won't have appeared yet on the L2, and so the L2 doesn't have to reorg. Um, so those are the two kind of changes. And I was talking about this in the context of a roll-up, posting transactions to, to the L1, but uh, everything is very similar, even in the case of the L2 using an LTA like EigenDA. I think uh, that that makes a lot of sense. Do you use the the validator set that you had kind of as an L one, um, kind of for the decentralized sequencer, or how do you construct it? Because kind of that's been a really hard problem for all L twos, kind of sequencer decentralization. And by in a way, you already had like I mean, if if you think about it in those terms, kind of the 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 sequencer in in is is kind of your validator set, right? So basically the sequencer is that entity that's allowed to kind of actually build um, the blocks. And you already had 110 distinct entities. So how do you enmesh these two things? Yeah, that's a really great question. And the answer is 100%. We will transition the validator set to the decentralized sequencer set. There's a lot of benefits in, in doing that. Uh, and it just ends up being a much more elegant migration for for the ecosystem. Um, and things like uh, slashing for equivocation, we actually get for free if we do that because we already have uh, slashing for equivocation on Celo. And so all of the finality guarantees that we offer today, basically the L2 inherits and then adds to that Ethereum security and finality uh, just with a longer time period. So if you're doing a small transaction, then maybe you're happy to wait for the cello sequencers to uh, agree on a transaction batch. But if you're doing a big transaction, maybe you wait a little bit longer until that transaction, uh, the existence of that transaction gets logged on, on Ethereum. How often do you settle to, to Ethereum? Because, I mean, so basically, if you look at the costs of L2s, I mean, it, it, de it depends how often you kind of check into Ethereum, but typically like 95% of the transaction costs kind of go to data availability and then like 5% go to like checking in. Obviously, you can kind of lower that by kind of checking in less frequently, but then kind of you have security later. So how, how do you navigate that? And did you decide kind of, kind of on a ceiling price, say for 100,000 gas or something that kind of you think would be acceptable to your average user? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, so we haven't uh, decided on on the period or, or the price right now. I think we're still doing that work. And one nuance, I guess, for us is that we're storing the transactions in EigenDA. Uh, and then EigenDA reference kind of pointer back to us, and we have to store that on Ethereum. Uh, and that is much smaller than obviously the set of all transactions. And so the gas costs of, of storing that is, is much, much, much less. And so that's how we can keep our low gas fees is basically by replacing that 95% cost that you just referenced with a much smaller cost that um, is, is likely going to cost, you know, something like 5%. So we might double the transaction fee on Celo, but we won't, you know, 20 exit um as part of this transition uh the exact period by which we will be posting that i think also depends a little bit on eigenda eigenda just went to testnet uh two weeks ago and so we're still waiting to see what the production specs will look like which will 
definitely impact kind of the design choice here. So the danger with being an L2 on Ethereum is obviously that kind of your transaction fees are directly coupled to Ethereum transaction fees, right? Because you kind of have to, you have to pay pro rata the kind of check-in costs of Celo on Ethereum. And currently gas fees are pretty low, but we've seen them spike in the past. And if you, if you kind of expect Ethereum to kind of eventually become the global settlement layer, and if you look at kind of the, the, the scaling roadmap of Ethereum, there's not actually, I mean, beyond dank sharding, which doesn't help you all that much because you're already using EigenDA anyways, um, there's not all that much to seriously speed up um, uh, scalability on Ethereum in the next couple of years. H how, how do you think about that kind of in terms of the applications that kind of rely on fairly low fees? Yeah, I, I think this design... Um caters to them. So I think by only having to sort of the, the EigenDA ref, um, you can you can dramatically, dramatically lower the fees. Uh, and certainly you can also um, change the period by which you're storing this. So that might also potentially give some uh, wiggle room for, for the chain. But yeah, I think given this design, I'm not, not too concerned even as Ethereum prices go back and, and go beyond where they were in um, in the last bull market. I think it goes it goes back to the earlier question as well, right? I think you know you can offer cello security, right, for some like for a lot of transactions, right, that kind of are below a certain threshold, but then have Ethereum security for sort of the more valuable transactions, right? And sort of um, you know, I think in many ways this is a concept that we're pretty familiar with um, even kind of pre-Web3, right, in terms of like, you know, the stuff that's in my physical wallet, right, kind of the security of that versus, you know, what's in my bank account and, and so on. So I think it's kind of, you know, and I, I think this is just a very simplified view of this, but I imagine as some of the L2 infrastructure kind of hardens, right, and uh, the improvements that, you know, all the teams that are focused on this are making even you know, since July, since we kind of well, openly started kind of that exploration has been pretty encouraging that there's a path towards continuing to lower that cost. But even if you completely discount kind of like all of the data availability costs that you incur, kind of just by settling on Ethereum periodically, you kind of, you have to pay that fee kind of as an L2 and you kind of have to kind of put this on the, single transactions that kind of happen on cello, which does actually put um, a um, a flaw on how little a transaction can cost, right? And kind of if, if costs on Ethereum go up, kind of the costs on cello have to go up by the same amount, just by virtue of kind of ultimately settling on Ethereum. So I think, so you're right, there is a floor, uh, but interestingly, this floor is not tied to the number of transactions in the L2. Right, uh, it is for rollups, right? Because you have to store transactions on chain. But if you're using um, EigenDA for data availability, then uh, the number of transactions that you put in any given block can be arbitrary. Uh, the size of this EigenDA reference is fixed. Uh, likewise, when you update the state route for the L2 bridge, uh, the amount of transactions that uh, executed uh, between state root updates can be arbitrary. So, so if it came to that, you you would just kind of prolong the period you'd wait until kind of updating the state root on Ethereum. Yeah, I would be surprised if we would have to do that because I think um, uh, even at high gas fees, um, the uh, just based on the amount of economic activity happening on Sela today, like I, I don't think that that would be. Uh, necessarily required, but yeah, absolutely. I think that I think more than that. I think we would look to scale Celo so that it it keeps up with Ethereum gas prices. I think is the answer. In principle, it also seems like a good route for kind of other chains to kind of decentralize their sequences, right? Because kind of yeah, it is a major problem. But maybe let's just move on. Um, so we already talked about MiniPay, the application um, of Opera Mini. Um, that kind of gives users natively 
a wallet without them kind of having to think of it as a wallet. Um, you also recently um, had something launched on Cello called Credit Collective, which I found uh, very enticing. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, one one of the use cases I've personally been, uh, and I think many in the ecosystem since the very early days, is giving people access to credit. Um, and so this actually was really an entirely led, uh, kind of community-led effort uh, where a bunch of people that were working on credit protocols got together and started meeting and organizing. And, uh, you know, some of the activity was centered on Cello, but it wasn't like, you know, that wasn't sort of like, oh, you know, you can't, you know, can't be here if you're not on Cello. So actually... A lot of uh, the early members were kind of building in different ecosystems. And uh, one thing that was kind of interesting was, was Credit Collective. It started really just uh, as a bunch of people that shared that kind of interest in bringing these solutions to market, um, meeting up and exchanging ideas without sort of it starting, you know, like usually a lot of these things start with like, you know, funding or some other thing right here. It was really just... It was kind of like a, you know, a group of people getting together and exchanging ideas. And then at some point, Credit Collective sort of formalized that and actually applied to the, the Cello on-chain uh, fund uh, for, for funding, for effectively funding to help bootstrap adoption of these protocols. So they requested, I think it was a total of 2 million uh, Cello euros, kind of Cello uh, backed stablecoin or kind of linked stablecoin, packed stablecoin. Um, to be used as uh, kind of seed seed capital on these protocols to extend, in many cases, what is you know direct to consumer or kind of you know small enterprises in the global south, uh, you know kind of credit, and and just to be clear, these are you know for the most part uh, under collateralized or non collateralized uh, loans, so not sort of the the ones you would get on Aave or, or Compound, um, and and really sort of extending, I think, the utility. Uh, of of Web three right to kind of the real world, which is which is something that's really exciting. Yeah, I don't know if you had specific questions about it. We should also, um, you know, I maybe to connect you to some of the people working on that. But I've I've been pretty excited by seeing something like that kind of take form and you know sort of that self organizing and uh, you know creating sort of a funding umbrella uh to it you know was was really cool to uh, to see to see that happening yeah and it's been cool to see some of these projects take off right so impact market which is uh, a ubi project on cello uh recently launched a micro lending campaign i think they have uh hundreds of thousands of, of dollars now that they've been uh lending out in the form of micro loans you can think of this as being an analogous to kiva uh in the web2 world um i think Kiva has had a lot of success in, in having this kind of donate to lend kind of uh, strategy. And, and I think it's it's had a lot of impact globally. And, and impact market is now replicating that by, by using crypto rails, um, allowing them to operate at, you know, uh, a fraction of, of the overhead of, of something like Kiva. And so, yeah, it's been it's been really great to see. Um, I think this these are the types of use cases that we have long talked about. In Web three, and that have gotten a lot of people, uh, you know, myself included, excited about Web three early on, uh, and it's just you know so nice to see them, you know, finally working on a large scale. Um, yeah, it's just been great. Are these sort of local initiatives? So, kind of, is this kind of like, say, for instance, I don't know where uh, where Impact Markets or kind of the 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 Kiva equivalent um, are based, but are these kind of by locals for locals, or is this kind of by um, well-intentioned global northerners um, for the global south. It's a mix. Um, so there are definitely projects that are originating in, you know, Nairobi, Manila, and you know, sort of right where the activity is. Um, but it's, but it's also, yeah, it's people coming out of the Kivas, right, and wanting to bring that. Uh, experience to solutions that I think have the potential to scale, um, well, you know, a lot better and, and leverage sort of the the infrastructure that Web three can provide. So it's uh, it's actually interesting because I think that cross pollination is also something that's I think benefits both. Right, it brings more of that local expertise to. to you know, maybe the teams that are coming at this not with that first-hand experience, 
Um, and also, you know, the other way kind of helps um, the teams that are kind of local, right, kind of exchange ideas with, you know, in terms of like, yeah, product development, other things that are maybe, you know, harder to kind of find peers in sort of local markets, uh, especially around some of these very specific use cases. So, um, yeah, that's that's been that's been fun to see. How do you foster and engage with um, your local communities? I imagine that, I mean, y you are both, you know, global north and us. So kind of how, how do you build communities in those places? Look, a lot of it happens at events, community events, sort of, in, you know, nothing is replaces in person. I think in many ways, um, Merrick and I joke about this, but the pandemic, I think, has probably, uh, you know, put us, you know, back, you know, kind of definitely quite a bit, right? Because in, in those years, it was impossible kind of to travel, right? And and, and spend time with, with communities on the ground. But um, I mean, personally, I try to spend time, um, you know, going, uh, going to meet with kind of local entrepreneurs and like even kind of see how the products that they're building are being used and just try to stay as close to that as possible. Because I think it does help, you know, when you talk to enough entrepreneurs and they tell you kind of their honest opinion of what needs to improve for them to be successful, right? That kind of um, gets you the clarity on sort of the more infrastructure level, right? What are some of the things that are not, you know, that that maybe you can help sort of move move on, right? And so that's kind of how things like Social Connect or Fiat Connect, which is, you know, protocol for helping people on and off ramp more easily in, in these different markets, have come about and and that's i think uh something that you only i think uh do get a sense for if you do spend a lot of times with the the builders in in local markets and i assume you kind of you have community people that are employed by the foundation or it, one of your companies kind of like in 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 those local communities right we, we do yeah i mean a lot of the team members also that are working you know at c labs or Valora or foundation or mento you know some of the kind of early ecosystem projects are also based uh you know uh, kind of all over the world so there's there's also a lot of that kind of expertise um but i'll personally say i you know i try to spend as much time as possible with with, with founders in the ecosystem and you know i think that's been that's been really i think for me the best way to stay up to date on what's happening um, you just mentioned Mento um, and reminded me that last week you guys announced that there's going to be a Mento DAO spin out. Tell us about that. Let's get into it. Yeah, so I mean, for people that have followed Salo for, um, you know, since the early days, uh, they may remember that through on-chain governance, um, a series of stable coins were, were launched, um, Salo Dollar, Salo Euro, Salo Real. And, uh, you know, that's become definitely one of the differentiating factors for the ecosystem. And I think we've been very fortunate that there, that there's been a team that's, um, basically said, Hey, you know, we want to, uh, go and, and grow this much more quickly than, you know, I think is otherwise would be possible, um, as just kind of a public good under the sort of general ecosystem umbrella and, uh, basically created a proposal um, or a kind of a process for um, for taking this uh, protocol and really making it standalone. And yeah, very kind of recently, just I think it was about last week or so, um, the team has put forward a proposal to kind of start talking about how they envision uh, governance to transition from from Celo to kind of a sort of a mentor token to, to, to do that. Um, so pretty exciting to see um, you know, in a sense of taking some of these things that, you know, initially maybe were kind of smaller features that may tell a little unique that are becoming protocols in their own right. And I think, you know, because of that are able to have a much more ambitious, um, you know, kind of agenda and potentially impact on the broader ecosystem um, as a result. So that's that's been that's been really exciting to see. Yeah, especially just thinking about this in the form of just DAO governance, right? I think having a, a potential DAO spin out, I think it's just an exciting, exciting thing to be happening. And so, yeah, I'm just eagerly awaiting next steps on on that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, super cool. So you guys have been around um, with Cello for say six or so years. Where where do you hope to be in six years from now? <laughs> wow. 
probably still working on cello. Uh, I mean, I, I really, I, I do feel there's with every sort of, you know, inflection point in terms of the technology or you know how the ecosystem is growing. I think there's, you know, you kind of you. It's like you're climbing a mountain and then you kind of you get to the point and you're like, oh man, there's all these kind of new pathways to explore and like different ways to grow, and and so I I really I mean our uh, I think we talked about this in the past, right? Sort of the um, cello uh, as a as a name comes from Esperanto means purpose, and you know we early on one of the first things we did even before writing a line of code was to sit down and write down you know kind of a mission for what we wanted to build and a set of values, and I think that has uh, really created a lot of space for within that what. Cello can be right, and of course now it's no longer just uh, the two of us and you know, Seb, our fellow co-founder, and some of the early team, but it's it's a whole community, right? And so a lot of the stuff we kind of get for free almost wherever people are sending us, much hey, I built this on Cello, and it's like, wow, yeah, this is like so cool. I don't think we would have ever gotten to this, right? So that's nice to see, but I think there's still a lot of uh, white space, right, in terms of if we if we take sort of prosperity for all as sort of the guiding mantra, you know, that that kind of mean. A lot more things than the things we're able to execute on today, right? And I think that's um, that's really exciting because I think the metric that um, is probably least talked about in these uh, things is sort of the the brain trust you can build around a project and an eco and sort of the ecosystem, right? And I I think about like some whatever you know. Recently, we were kind of going deep down the rabbit hole on on this side and. I just, you know, happened to be in our community space here in Berlin, and I was like, there was a founder, and I was like, hey, have you talked? Have you looked at this? And immediately, like, oh yeah, you know, here's some ideas, and he immediately pointed me to some kind of other things, and it's kind of like, it's incredible to see how much more quickly one can move as an ecosystem on some of these pretty hard, difficult kind of concepts and ideas, right? And some of these things may take years to get to full fruition, right? But it's possible when you have kind of a mission aligned group of people that are all sort of in a way like oriented around the same kind of shared set of goals. And so, yeah, six years from now, probably, you know, like, yeah, working on things that uh, hopefully expand sort of what what Cello can, can mean in terms of bringing more prosperity to more people, um, but probably also some very, you know, like stupid things that we thought would be solved by then. You know, I mean, I look back six years and we're like, okay, on and off ramping seems pretty easy, <laughs> but which are like clients seems pretty hard, right? And uh, guess what? We're still we're still tackling on and off ramping, right? So I think that's sometimes also hard to predict, but um, I think a lot of, you know, whatever it is, it will be under sort of that kind of general umbrella of the, the Mission North Star. Maybe just to offer my take, People are, are frequently surprised to hear that Tron is is the number one chain by daily active users, uh, and and they do that primarily because there's a lot of payments happening um, with Tether on Tron globally. And so my sincere hope uh, for the Cell ecosystem and for the Ethereum ecosystem uh, is that you know we can reclaim uh, the Ethereum ecosystem can reclaim that top spot, and you know that Cello can be the L2. Uh, that um, where you know that that type of payment activity is, is happening. Um, we're already seeing a lot of that happening on Celo. I think we're frequently a top ten chain by daily active users. Um, but uh, let's work together as an Ethereum ecosystem and and take the, the top spot. We don't need to wait five years for that. We can do it sooner. <laughs> That's a lovely closing remark. Um, where can people go and find out more about Zello, how to build on you, or how to kind of uh, use products that are built on Zello or kind of just get involved um, with the community? I mean, definitely celloorg.org um, is our website uh, for the ecosystem. Uh, Twitter uh, as well, I think is sort of one where the, you know, we try to kind of capture things that are happening in the ecosystem. There's regular uh, community, uh, you know, kind of meetings, some of uh, them kind of organized by the community. Um, usually at most of the major conferences, there's, you know, Ethereum conferences, there's going to be some event or meetup as well. Um, I would, my recommendation would be if you're someone who is 
interested in Salo or getting involved in the ecosystem, just yeah, find out where the next event is and show up or or ping someone, you know, in the community, a founder even. Um, I think there's so many touch points and I think uh I'm you know happy to vouch for, you know, really you know, the ecosystem founders that they're all a friendly bunch and, you know, will be very happy to chat and uh and and sort of give their perspective and 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 help and support new people coming into the space. And uh yeah, I think those are probably the sort of more general things. Um I do probably also want to plug uh unplugged which Merrick, you, you started with Kobe a while back just to share updates on the progress around the L2 work and you know where you're sort of bringing folks on uh, to to give sort of more detailed kind of tech deep dives on on some of the diff, you know the, kind of the different areas kind of across that that stack that uh, is being considered. And I think I mean I, I even like every time I listen in on, on those I, I learn uh, I learn something. So highly recommend that even. You know, if you're not just interested in Celo, but just generally following L2 uh, sort of developments in the broader ecosystem. Super cool. Thank you both for coming on. It was uh, super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was amazing. I love the questions.